Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this bonus addition to our seminar series. We're taking the advantage of James Cave and visiting here today to sneak in an extra one. Um, but James is a PhD student at the University of Bath in the UK. There's very strong groups there working on the, the theory of various uh, semiconductor materials of interest in, in uh, photovoltaics. And uh, James is doing his PhD under the supervision of Alison Walker there, work, looking at the, at the properties of perovskites and organic solar cells at the meso scale. And um, he's presently in Australia working in Newcastle with the University of Newcastle and the CSIRO, looking at the properties of ternary organics. And his title today will be Exploring and Controlling Energy Transport in Organic Semiconductors. So James, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, so yes, um, I've been in Australia for five weeks now, um, working at, as we said, at Newcastle um, University and at CSIRO. Um, so we've been looking at uh, organic um, cells, but specifically we're interested in ternary ones. Um, so you'll be familiar with binary, and ternary is literally used out in another material. Um, so let's get started. Um, I wasn't sure exactly how much people would know about organics, organics so I've put in a small exiton slide as well just to sort of say. So um, uh, the issue with uh, organic materials is they've got quite a small uh, permittivity. Um, and what that means is that you've got quite a strong Coulomb interaction. So um, when you have a photon, uh, get absorbed and produce an electron hole pair, the charge carriers don't readily separate and then uh, drift diffuse to um, the electrodes. Uh, you have to uh, first split them apart yourself. Um, so they, they move around as uh, what we call an exciton. So because it's an electron and a hole together, that's electrically, electrically neutral. Um, and in order to get those charge carriers out, the electron and the hole, you have to find an interface to uh, split them up. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, if you've got an electron and a hole together, surely that's not very good because they just immediately recombine, and that's true. Uh, that's the issue. They recombine in nanoseconds, uh, often shorter. And the way that excitons move around, because they have to get from where they're created to an interface, um, one of the ways, at least, is uh, forced resonance energy transfer. So the electron and the hole there act as a dipole, an oscillating dipole, so that's meant to be a little spring, and they sort of wiggle. Um, and dipole-dipole um, coupling between the exciton there and the uh, ground state electron. Um, you can get energy transfer via a near field effect. So it's radiationless um, because, yeah, it's, it's near field because the wavelength of um, the photon would be quite a lot longer than the distance. So that distance there is of the order a nanometer to maybe a 10, uh, 10 nanometers or so. Um, so it's radiationless. Um, some people call it fluorescence resonance energy transfer. I think in biology they tend to do that. Um, and it's, it's kind of odd because it, it depends on the fluorescence properties of uh, the material, but there isn't actually any photon given off because it would violate, can't travel faster than the speed of light, can't, you must conserve energy, you must conserve momentum, those little things. Um, so that's quite important. Um, the equation for how quickly it travels, uh, sorry, uh, the rate at which a hop will occur, uh, is um, there's a prefactor there, one over tau, um, but the important bit is it's dependent on the sixth power of distance. So R naught there is a characteristic length, the Forster radius, which I'll cover in a second. Um, but as you can see, it's very, very uh, sensitive to distance. So biologists use it a lot as I think they call it fluorescence or molecular ruler or something. Um, but we're interested in just the energy moving. Um, that one over tau makes it a um, deals with the units, uh, but there's also, a, I'll discuss on the next slide, um, why that must be that. It's just to do with the definition of R0. Um, and so the exciton will instantly hop from one place to another. Um, there we are. So the Forster radius, I've just reproduced that equation there so you can remember. Uh, so R0 is defined, it's kind of an odd definition. It's if you've got your exciton and where it will hop to, 
if they're at the Forster radius, then the quantum efficiency of the hop is 50% compared to just recombining. Um, so what, what that means is the rate of the hop is equal to the rate of the exciton recombining. Um, so that's what that is there. Uh, the rate of threat over the total rate, which is threat plus recombination. We're only considering these two uh, processes here. Um, and you can see if r is r naught there, the six power bit goes, and you've got 1 over tau, which is the recombination rate, equals rate of threat. So that makes sense. Um, from theory, uh, you get that interesting equation. I've never seen a 9,000 in any other equation. Um, but what that is, is uh, q naught there is the uh, quantum, the fluorescence quantum yield, so that's just a measure of how good the molecule is at um, fluorescing. Um, the kappa squared, uh, that's to do with the relative orientation of the dipoles, because depending on how they're oriented, there's a different uh, yield. Uh, we just take that as two thirds here, which is a, uh, that's the average value. Um, the important bit though is that j. Uh, the j is the spectral overlap. So if you've got there, oh, I'll use this. There we are. Uh, so if you've got your dipole here, and that's its fluorescent spectrum, and there's, so, yeah, the dipole's the exciton, and you've got your electron here, and that's its absorption spectrum, the spectral overlap is literally just that area there. Um, so, what do we do with our exciton? So these are, uh, I've taken here the example of uh, P3HT, which is a hole transporter, and PCBM, which is an electron transporter. And um, those are two <coughs> materials that are used very commonly in organics. And you can see here, so this is one way. So maybe a photon strikes here and you get your exciton. It can then homotransfer, so homo meaning same, and transfer, so it transfers within the same material. It can hop to an interface. And then when it's at the interface, um, exactly how exitons dissociate is a matter of some controversy. Um, but the generally accepted way, I think, is the electron will hop over here to the electron transporter and then they can drift diffuse away. So you need a difference in energy. Uh, ooh, where's my mouse gone? There he is. A difference in energy here between here and here. So the energy level, um, it'll be energetically favourable for the electron to hop here, but not favourable for the hole to hop. Um, so yeah, that's how you split them up. Um, or alternatively, you could get it here. So in this case, the hole hops over to the hole transporter. And then uh, what we are quite interested in is the case here, where you don't just have to, exons don't just have to hop within the same material. So here, the exon is just hopping from P3HT to P3HT. Here, it's just PCBM to PCBM. But it can also hop between materials, but only one way, usually. So here, for example, you've got your exciton, and maybe it homotransfers around a bit. It can then heterotransfer, provided that's a decrease in energy or only a small increase. Um, but um, so long as you've got the spectral overlap from the previous slide, so the fluorescence of the donor, which would be P3HT here, so long as there's an overlap with the uh, absorption of the acceptor, you can get a heterotransfer and then it might hop around and then dissociate from this side. Uh, so we wanted to model that. So we're using Kinetic Monte Carlo. Um, so basically, we use random numbers to uh, give us a possible um, way the system could evolve over time. Uh, the important thing is the built-in clock. So it's, you can look at it over time, and you can look specifically at what each uh, entity, so as far as we're concerned, it's exitons, um, is doing. Uh, so the way KMC works is you basically run it several times, and then or lots of times. And then you can, that'll give you a statistically correct um, way for the system to evolve over time. So you, we need to give it um, all the possible things that can happen and the rates at which like, they will happen. And then you get your random numbers and work out a possible output. And then you can get a list out of, at this time, this happened, at this time, this happened, for example. So that's just simple output there. Uh, we're using the first reaction method, which I'll discuss, I think, in a couple of slides. Uh, so the system, so what are we looking at? Uh, we're just considering excitons here. Um, so what we have is a cubic lattice. Uh, spacing is one nanometer because we think that's about 
right for the distance between uh, hopping sites. Um, so each site is a certain material. So, for example, this sort of beigey colour is P3HT and this is PCBM. Uh, Exotons exist on a certain site, they're localised. Uh, we limit site occupancy to one, to kind of two on top of each other. Um, and the important bit is interface sites, because of course that's where we want our exotons to go in a solar cell. We want them to go to the interface, we can then split them up into the charge carriers, which can then be collected uh, for, um, well, yeah, for the solar cell to work, basically. Uh, so what sort of things can happen? What events do we have? Um, so we've got a hop via fret, of course. Um, so that's the equation from before, with that six power, that little prefactor. And then we've uh, we put in a Boltzmann term here for if the energy goes up. So if you've got a decrease in energy, that's always fine. And then anyone who's ever looked at, say, the Metropolis algorithm will recognise this bit. Um, this just means that if energy is increasing, it's less likely to happen because it needs to uh, pick up energy from, say, phonons, uh, lattice vibrations, in order to have the energy um, uh, for that event to happen. Uh, recombination, you've got an electron and a hole right next to each other, they're going to recombine. Um, so that's just one over the lifetime, quite simple. And of course generation. Um, we worked out what generation rate we'd need uh, for to get AM 1.5 equivalent in our system. And it turns out if you have 10 exitons per second per lattice site, that works out to be AM 1.5. Uh, dissociation, which is of course um, the important bit, uh, we treat that slightly differently uh, because um, generally in KMC it is treated differently. Um, largely, yeah. Um, it's d a, long, a large part of it is how do exons actually dissociate? <coughs> there are differing theories. Um, it could be that you have, so for example, in this case, the electron would hop over to the electron transporter. Um, I've heard it suggested that maybe there's some kind of divergence of the uh, permittivity at an interface. Um, so we've done basically what everyone else has done so that we can then compare, um, which is that when an exciton arrives at a site, so maybe it's created there, or maybe it hops to an uh, interface site, it then has a probability p, which we can then vary. Um, and with probability p, it will instantly dissociate. Uh, otherwise, there's no effect. So how does KMC work? Now we've, we've seen, OK, so what can happen? What the rates they can happen? So how does our little black box KMC work? Um, so we have a queue, and that's the important thing. Um, so we, have, we order all the events by how quickly they will happen. That's why it's called. And the reason we're using the first reaction method is because we go through the queue and we execute each event in order. Um, so whenever anything happens, we have to update that queue because Say, for example, um, I were to walk this way, I can now, for example, walk another step this way or another step this way, so you then have to update. Um, if you've got a new exciton, then you've got to then work out, OK, so it can now recombine, it can now hop to different places. Um, so whenever anything happens, you update that queue. Um, we then generate um, times to occur for each event and use that formula there. So what this is, is that minus LUN of U we get a random number u uniformly drawn, and we put it through. Um, the minus LUN is the inverse cumulative distribution function, I think, of the uh, exponential, of an exponential distribution, because we're modeling all our events as Poissonian. So an exponential distribution of times will represent uh, statistically how, of, how long you expect things to take. Um, and then there's a scaling factor there, so you uh, divide it by the rate so that then faster things occur sooner. Um, then you insert those into the queue. And then an interesting bit with FRM, which is why it's so useful, is you don't actually have to remember every possible hop, because an exciton could hop from where it is to you know, thousands, potentially more, sites. Um, you only have to remember the fastest one. Because if an exton hops, for example, to the left, it can, no, it can no longer hop from where it was to the right. I mean, what, once it's hopped you know, from site naught to site minus one, it can't hop from site naught anymore because it's not there. So you only have to consider uh, the fastest of a set of mutually exclusive events. So that's why it's quite useful. You can 
uh, reduce your memory usage compared to not using the FRM, FRM where you have to remember everything. Uh, method is very simple, really. Um, so one thing you have to do is check invalid events. So for example, if I have the event that an exciton recombines, and then after it, an event that the exciton moves, you have to check if it's recombined, it can no longer move because it's, it's gone now. So you have to get rid of that. Then you just do the first event. You reduce all of the other times by how long that took. So if it takes a nanosecond for the exciton to hop, you then go through the queue and take a nanosecond off everything. Um, you then check to see what things can now happen. So if you've got a new exciton, you have to put in all of its uh, possible, you have to check all its possible hops and put in one of those, the fastest one. You have to uh, put in a, a recombination event. If something hops, you have to put in new hops from where it now is. Um, and then you just repeat that until you've got what you want. So for example, uh, we ran our, our, our simulations for um, I think it was 100 microseconds uh, each time. So we checked as 100 microseconds passed if it has, we're done. Um, so which values? So we need to know what values to put into our simulation. Uh, so these are the values we came up with. Um, anything cited uh, we got from literature, so exciton lifetimes and uh, diffusion lengths. So Q0 is the uh, fluorescence quantum yield. As I discussed before, that's just how good the uh, material is at fluorescing. Uh, that's the diffusion length in nanometers. Um, that's how f that's the, the root mean square of how far an exciton will uh, travel from where it's created. Exciton lifetime is how long you expect your exciton to last before recombining. And then that's the energy disorder of the material. Um, within a material, not every molecule will be at exactly the same energy level. Um, there'll be a distribution of energies, and that distribution is approximately Gaussian. Um, so you could work out a standard deviation for that. And those values there are the standard deviations uh, we found. Uh, we can find that out by simply looking at the fluorescent spectrum. Um, if you look at a fluorescent spectrum, it's roughly Gaussian, and then you simply fit a normal distribution to that and see what the uh, standard deviation is. So uh, that, that was Krishna's job. Um, I did the KMC, and he was in the lab working that out. Uh, so forced to radii, that's the important bit. So that basically controls how quickly um, excitons can hop around. So uh, for heterotransfer to start with, so that's off diagonal, um, where, you've put, where I've put a dash there, that means um, there's no overlap or there's a massive energy increase. Um, no, no overlap between the fluorescence spectrum of the donor and the absorption spectrum of the uh, acceptor. So uh, P3HT has the highest excitonic energy, so excitons can hop from there to the two other materials. And then uh, square N, which I haven't discussed yet, that's an, our, that'll be our third material in a minute, little spoiler there. Um, that's got the smallest excitonic energy, so it can only have homotransfer. That five became important, because um, that's quite large. Remember that um, hopping rate is dependent on the sixth power of R0, so that's quite important there. Um, for the values along the leading diagonal for homotransfer, uh, that was slightly more difficult. Uh, what we did was simulate just a box of a single material, and then we put an exciton in the middle, and then we just let it hop around. Um, so we know what its lifetime is from literature, we know what the uh, excitonic energy disorder of the material is from looking at the fluorescent spectra. So you put those in and then you tune, you put also put in a guess for your Forster radius and then you see, okay, so over you know, 100,000 exitons, what's the root mean square of the distance they travel? Do you get the um, known diffusion length? And then you just tune that R0 you put in until you get the right value. Uh, so it turns out that P3HT and PCBM both have 2.3 nanometers, which is kind of annoying because it looks like I've just sort of made that up, but it turns out they actually are the same. And then uh, square N, which I haven't come to yet, um, that's got a far smaller one. Uh, so th yeah, these are the spectra. Uh, so the fluorescent spectra are the dotted lines, and the absorption spectra are the solid lines. Uh, and I've got AM 1.5 there, the black line. 
Um, yeah, it, you sort of have to plot them on the same graph because the important thing is the overlap, but then you plot them on the same graph and you can't really see anything. Um, so uh, if you take, for example, P3HT, so its um, fluorescence is, I think, that line. And you can see there's overlap there with um, the other one. Uh, ignore the green line. That's PTNT. Um, we, tried, we were tr going to try using that, but um, the simulations ended up taking so long that um, then I think they're nearly done now, so that would be good. <laughs> We've got that. Uh, energy levels. Um, so these are the electronic energy levels. So this is why P3HT is the hole transporter. The holes like to go upwards. And the PCBM is our electron transporter. Um, and um, yeah, so squaring, I'll come on to in a minute. I haven't said much about that yet. Uh, P3HT and PCBM. So if you've got an exciton, say, here, um, when you put the PCBM and the P3HT together, you can see the hole doesn't want to go that way because it's going downwards and holes like to go upwards. Um, but the, oh, sorry, wrong way around. Uh, the, the hole, which is here, doesn't like to go downwards, uh, but the, ex the electron does like to go downwards. So the electron will happily go there, and now they're far away from each other, so they can drift a fuse away. Uh, so what we were uh, interested in is, um, to start with, we just looked at binary BHJs. Um, and most KMC models in literature um, completely ignore the existence of heterotransfer. So I've just reproduced that there. So that's heterotransfer, where it hops from one to the other. Um, so we wanted to look, OK, so what effect does this actually have um, in uh, the system? Um, so to study that, we varied P, which is the probability of an exciton dissociating when it's on a, an interface site. Um, and we looked then at the uh, exciton dissociation efficiency, which is just the fraction of excitons that do manage to dissociate um, over the total um, excitons that were put into the system, because of course some will be combined before you can uh, split them in half. So here we've got an exciton on P3HT. So it has P, P3HT, chance of the electron then hopping over here when it reaches the interface site. And then when you're on the other side, this is the PCBM. An exciton here, when it reaches an interface site, there's a chance P, PCBM, for the hole to hop across here and for them to have dissociated. Uh, so, of course, we need a morphology to put in. So the way this is done is it's done by a really sort of weird convoluted icing model. So what you do is you get um, your um, a cube of the correct size. So that's uh, 80 by 80. And then you just assign <laughs> sites randomly. So for that, uh, coloured in sites would be one material and empty sites would be another material. And you carry this icing type model where um, you allow, you look at different uh, flips of, OK, let's take this site, let's take this site. If I swap the materials around, uh, do you uh, reduce the um, energy of the system? And the effect of that is you end up with something like this. And we characterize this by a feature size. So V here is just the volume, so it's that times that times that. And then A is the interfacial area. So you look at um, how, how much area there is between um, one material and the other. Because if, of course, you've got something very, very random, then you've got lots and lots of interfacial area. Whereas if everything's clumped together, you've got a higher um, volume to surface area ratio. So that's how that works. Um, so here we've got a feature size of 15 nanometers. And that one is 31 nanometers. Uh, so we changed the feature size as well. Uh, so first of all, we looked at just a bulk etcher junction with our hole transporter and our electron transporter. Um, and we varied the P for the P3HT and for the PCBM and looked at what happened. So this is with heterotransfer. Um, you can see that as we change P, P3HT, actually there's not much of a change. Um, and that makes sense because P3HT is the material that the excitons can hop from. So they can hop from P3HT to the PCBM. So even if you reduce 
the probability from 100 down to, say, 1%. Not that much of a difference because the excitons, they get to the interface, okay, there's basically no chance of them dissociating. They can just hop across and then dissociate from the other side. Uh, whereas you can see that for the PCBN, we reduce it. They can't, the excitons can't hop from PCBM to P3HT because uh, there's no overlap there. There's no overlap J of the, uh, the spectra, uh, and it's a big increase in energy. Um, so they're, they're, they're basically stuck at that point. So they'll just keep bumping into the interface, trying, and and they ended up recombining. Um, whereas if you say we just ignored heterotransfer, which is what most other models do, uh, you don't get that. So the, the situation with the PCBM is still the same. They can't hop away. But because you've ignored the fact that in P3HT they can, hop a, they can heterotransfer to the PCBM, um, it means that by reducing the P3HT probability, the, electron, the excitons there are stuck as well, so you're ignoring the fact they could hop across. Uh, so you end up with a difference. Uh, so for small P3HT, you actually underestimate how many um, excitons can dissociate because you ignore the fact that they can hop across to the PCBM and dissociate there. Um, so you do end up with a, an error. So that's 30% different. That's fairly significant. Um, and along the middle bit, it's fine. Now, we wanted to consider, OK, so what, what does P actually mean physically? Well, P is an in, um, a measure of how good the other material is at basically extracting its, um, its particles. So P for P3HT is a measure of how good the PCBM is at taking the electron. And P for PCBM is sort of a measure of how good the P3HT is at taking the hole across. Um, the hole transfer tends to be faster than electron transfer. So we think that we're probably... Uh, so yeah, if hole transfer is faster, then we think we're probably in this sort of region. Certainly the, the upper left triangle there. So we think that other KMC models have been neglecting... Um, by, by neglecting heterotransfer, they're actually underestimating how many excitons can dissociate. Um, so we then had to look at actually how, how many excitons are actually doing this. And it turns out it's actually a load. So when you reduce the P3HT down, you can see more than half the excitons in the system are actually starting in the P3HT and then hopping across to the PCBM and then dissociating that way. Um, so you're, by ignoring hetero threat, you're actually ignoring what most of the excitons do. Um, so Lloyd, back in 2008, uh, came up with experimental evidence that suggests that there may be this two, this two-step dissociation. So that's when it starts, PCHT hops across and then dissociates back. Um, and you can see even, I mean, the the smallest number is down there at the bottom right. I mean, you're still looking at over 10% of the excitons actually doing this. So it doesn't really matter how good the materials are at um, extracting the particles. This is always going to happen. Uh, so then we moved on to um, ternary BHJs. Um, so what you do with a ternary bulk, bulk heterojunction is you get your two normal materials, so P3HT, PCBM, and you literally just stick it another one. Um, and that, can, that does change the properties, and they can be better, although it's a lot harder to actually make them, because you've now got three materials, you have to make sure all the energies are lined up, that sort of thing. Uh, so we use square rain. That's what the SQ is. Um, and for our system, we took our morphologies and then we took random interface sites and replaced them with square rain. Um, and we varied how many of these random interface sites we would replace um, as a fraction of um, how many PCBM sites there were, which is also how many P3HG sites there were because we used equal numbers of those. Um, and we ended up with this. So we got three different feature sizes. We've got 14 and 15, which is quite close, and then we've got 31, which is massively larger. Um, so we wanted to look at, uh, this is a graph of eta again, how many, uh, which fr the fraction of excitons um, that are dissociating. And we looked at um, how the concentration of square rain affects that. So you can see that as you increase it, you always get an increase. Now for the smaller feature sizes, it's not so big, 
but for the larger feature size, I mean, that's a pretty healthy increase, really, from 65% about to about uh, 75%. So that, that's quite a chunky increase. So that third material is really helping. Um, the reason, if you remember back to the Forster radius slide, there was up 5 nanometers. Um, excitons in the P3HT can hop uh, very efficiently to the square rain, and in the PCMBM as well, although they're not quite on such a level. And the reason it helps is because uh, with larger feature size, you've got larger clumps of the same material, which of course you don't want for dissociation. Um, in organic cells, you have this trade-off of um, you can try to make all the, the feature size really, really small and clump all the material up, and you've got loads of interfaces everywhere, so you can get lots and lots of excitons dissociating. The trouble is, is that once they've then dissociated, you've now got your electron in the middle of this awful labyrinth of material, and it has to try to get its way back to the electrodes without recombining. So if you have a feature size that's too small, um, you get lots of excitons dissociating, and then the holes in the electrons just end up getting lost and recombining. Um, on the other hand, you could just have a kind of really flat interface. You've got very little interfacial area, so all the electrons in the holes can get out quite easily, but most of the excitons are just recombining. So you have to have this trade-off. Um, so uh, this, is quite use this is quite a useful thing to know, because by improving the dissociation efficiency for the larger feature sizes, it might allow you to combine the, um, the charge carrier extraction efficiency, so how easy it is for the charge carriers to get to the interfaces, but still keep up this large exciton dissociation efficiency. Um, so that was quite a, a nice result. Um, and then we had a look at, so how, how much work is this square ring doing? So this graph here is uh, the fraction of the excitons that do dissociate, how many of, what fraction of those are dissociating at an interface with the square ring. Um, so that count, that's either an exciton in the square ring dissociating to something else or from something else to square ring. Um, obviously, if you've got no square ring, it's not doing anything. But then as you increase it, even just 1% concentration, for the larger feature size, well over a third of the excitons are now actually uh, dissociating at a square ring interface. Uh, so it, it, it does have quite a big effect. And then you increase it up and you've got just an overwhelming majority of them by 5%. Um, so, uh, yeah, we were quite excited by that, actually, because um, we think that we can use this now to inform uh, just making organic cells. OK, so is using this third material useful? Well, for the, the small feature size, not so much. I mean, it's... That, that's an increase, but it's, that's from, what, 86 to, like, 90. And it's quite hard to put in a third material in terms of, like, manufacturing. Uh, so it may not be useful. But for a large feature size, um, the addition of a third material can really help um, your dissociation efficiency. Um, so, yeah, it might then be worth using uh, a third material there. Uh, with your large feature size and see if you can then get the best of both worlds with lots of excitons dissociating by having this third material for them to hop to um, and then dissociate from um, while still allowing the electrons in the holes to reach their electrodes. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Are there any questions? Are these efficiencies that you're, you're modelling and predicting uh, improvements, are you seeing those in, in conversion efficiencies? I mean, you, you said you haven't even tried the square rain or square ream, whichever it is. Yeah, yeah I think it's square rain. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah um, ternary cells um, do give better PCEs. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm a theorist and I let Krishna go into the lab and actually get his hands dirty. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he, he's said that, I mean, he's found that ternary blends uh, do tend to be better. So there is, yeah, putting in the squaring does help um, in practice as well. So we have reproduced that. At what point did you at squaring? Why, why pick that as a material? Um, the energy levels are nicely lined up. 
Um, that, that's the, the main thing. So with organic materials, you've got God knows how many polymers. They're, they're making new ones all the time. Um, the, the main thing is basically, can you, with, with ternary, it's quite difficult, because with binary, you've just got two materials. So it's fairly easy to find two that will work. With ternary, all three have got to work together, unless you've got some clever way of, with like nanopart uh, nanoparticle cells, they, they keep the core. With nanoparticle cells, you can have a core of one material and then a shell of another, and then you've got whatever another material they're sort of in. So you can keep the core from the, the outside with this shell. So that's one way of around it. But with ternary, it's generally a case of can you get three that actually work. Um, square vein does work um, and has been used before, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is perhaps more a computing question than um, a material question. So, so how does your kinetic uh, model cue, how does it differ from a cellular automaton and what's the advantage of using it? A cellular automatic system. No, where you have an array and you basically iterate through the array um, for each time constant. Um, so I, I, I've not heard of. Can, can you? So, so um, and they often use these structures for uh, simulating. I mean, I've seen them use for simulating the growth of bushfires, for example. Mm -hmm. That you have all your reactions for each cell. And you can so you can have rate constants as well, and then for each time. So, so what would the, the cell be? The, it's yeah. an array. So it's it, in the case of bushfire propagation. It's it's how bushfires propagate through an area. Right. And so every you you, you discrete discretize a problem in a two D array, and then for every cell you have a set of reactions that can occur, um, and then you typically iterate through the array based on the time constant, an incremental time constant. Now, in your model, you you actually create a queue based on your rate cons rate reactions, and then you process through the queue. So, do you get the same answer? Oh, I see. So, basically, do all of the events that can happen sort of uh, at once, sort of thing. Mm. Uh, I don't really talk about okay, yeah. It's, yeah, it's more computing question. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, do you consider the charge transfer states as well when you consider um, tra dissociation? Uh, no, we just considered the excitons, but we we kept that in mind in terms of if you've got a smaller feature size, your electrons are going to get trapped yeah. and recombine. Um, so that that was um, why we wanted to improve the larger feature sizes specifically, um, and why the fact that the larger feature size improving um, was um, quite a nice result because that does allow the electrons and the holes to um, uh, to get out yeah um, so yeah so yeah we um, we looked at it um, but we didn't we didn't model that specifically we were looking specifically at excitons um. mm -hmm. two questions you talked about hole transfer very fast and electron transfer slower <laughs> yeah slow slow uh, I mean it's not Hugely different. So that's only for the binary system that you looked at. Is it the same for ternary as well? Uh, it, it does. It also depends on which materials you're using specifically. Um, for the system we were using, um, hole transfer uh, seems to be the faster thing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about other materials. Mm. And then in one of your graphs with the absorption and the fluorescence spectrum, spectra. Mm -hmm. With the AM 1.5, there was hardly any overlap with the blue curves. So, what does it mean when you can't see much overlap in, in the blue curves? Between the yeah, PCMB, yeah, yeah. the PCMB and its self. Do you mean? Yeah. So, what what does it mean when you see something that's got hardly any J in there overlapping? Um, basically, it means everything else has to make up for it, more or less. Um, hang on, what was that equation? Uh, yeah. Um, so in in that case, um, the Forster radius. I think yeah, the Forster ra radius for uh, PCBM. Yeah, it ended up being. Are reasonable as well. Um, uh, 
Uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, you, you can see the, the overlap isn't massive for any of them. Really. Well, you probably can't see because it's quite a nasty graph. Um, but yeah, it, there's, there's enough, more or less. Um, yeah, there's, there's enough of an overlap. Um, it, yeah, it's not very much. Um, hmm. I mean, I get that kind of a cop out, but that, that was Krishna's thing. Um, I, yeah, he, he looked at the overlap and worked out what it was. Um, for things between. For the ones within, we use the um, put an exton in a box, see how far it goes approach. Um, and the diffusion, exton diffusion length in PCBM has been measured to be uh, pretty reasonable. Oh, wrong way. Yeah, so it, it's nine nanometers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's smaller than, say, P3HT. Um, but that that that's been been measured, so it's it's clearly enough. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's not a great answer. I can't really say much more. I'm not entirely sure. Um, hey, I'm wondering how the hetero transfer is affected by the energy levels, like the energy alignment, because like both the electron and the hole are jumping at the same time. Um, yeah. Um, so what, what's important in terms of energy is the um, th this isn't a great, this is actually the electronic energy levels. So if you did lots of if you did sums very quickly, you've noticed that for the PCBM it's actually larger. Um, what y what's important is the the difference in the energy levels, and the excitons do manage to do it. Um, how exactly they do hop across? Um, it's because um, it is a it is a pho well it's a, a virtual photon if you like that sort of thing. Um, so it's not actually the electron and the hole hopping together as such, it's more they transfer the energy via a virtual photon. Um, so it's, it's the electron and the hole don't actually hop together. Um, the electron and the hole recombine and that energy is passed across um, as far as we know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the other oh, the other thing I was saying is that that's the electronic energy level. Uh, PCBM is weird because it has a an optical band gap that's smaller than its electronic band gap. We think that's due to some sort of forbidden uh, transition. Um, so for op optical levels, uh, the P3HT is the largest, followed by PCBM, and then square has got the smallest um, uh, optical band gap because it's uh, an optical thing with the um, the, the energy transfer. That that would be for the electrons and the holes. So that, that's why the square vein being sort of trapped on the interface is okay, because the electrons will go, uh, can we get it right this time? They'll go to the PCBM and the holes will go to the P3HT. So having square vein sort of in the middle is fine because they can escape then. You said you chose the Poisson distribution for the events. So uh, why did you choose that? Yes. Um, because um, we uh, are assuming that it's a. Um, yeah, we, we, we believe it's a Poissonian process, so it doesn't. Um, so if you. Yeah, so it's, it's memoryless, so there's a certain chance of it happening per unit time. Um, and. Because it, it's memoryless, if it's sitting there for a bit, then it doesn't remember it sat there for a bit, the chance is still the same. Um, and when you work that out, you get an exponential distribution. So it, it's just like with radioactivity, it's the same, um, the same thing with that exponential, because it's a, it, yeah, your particle doesn't remember how long it, ago it was made, if you see what I mean. But uh, when you consider just one exciton, mm -hmm. uh, probably that is true, but when you Look at, uh, for example, a solar cell where the electron, the excitons are getting accumulated in one cell, and you have this a diffusion uh, happening into the interface. Uh, in that case, will that will the Poisson distribution assumption will that hold true? Um, we believe so. I mean, in terms of like exciton concentration, we actually found that we very rarely actually had more than one exciton in the system at once. It turns out that um, because the lifetime is so short and the hopping rate is so fast, they can generally dissociate on the order of, well, they, they have to dissociate on the order of nanoseconds to actually be able to dissociate without just immediately uh, falling apart. Um, so in terms of having lots of excitons together, 
um, that doesn't make a huge difference. Um, or it shouldn't make a difference, actually, because they're not interacting, um, because they're electrically neutral. Um, yeah, yeah. I think did I answer that. I think I did. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's our last question, but James will be around the end, so other questions are welcome to come up. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so considering the nature of Exeter, so it has to be collected by uh, whole transportation, the material and the, the electron transportation material. So is this factor uh, limit the thickness of the, the, uh, the organic uh, sort of material, so that you have the thickness too, too thick, then the exoton won't be the interface can't be at all. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that was, that's ex exactly the point as well with the, uh, the feature size. Um, if you've got a really thick organic cell, then um, you, you, it's better to have a thin one because then the charge carriers don't have to go very far. Um, yeah, with, with the extons as well, you do need to, you need to keep, it's only the generation that matters in that, um, in the BHA bit where you've got all that nice um, interfacial area. Um, so yeah, I mean, organics, you'd need to keep the, f the f it would be a, a thin film type of thing, I think generally, unless you could get that sort of morphology over quite a long scale. And then if you did that in the middle, you've then got electrons and holes which then have to traverse this colossal maze and they probably just get lost and recombine. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of film thickness, organics is gonna be a thin one. To, to, to a close there, but let's thank James once more for his very interesting presentation. <laughs>